So today we continue the series, three-week series that we started last week. So here we find ourselves in the middle, sometimes the messy middle, as it would be, uh, a series called More Than Enough, a series about living with a sense of abundance and raging against scarcity that culture teaches us that we'll never have enough. But that sense of scarcity doesn't compute in God's economy, not within these walls or within the walls of God's kingdom here on earth or in heaven where there is more than enough, more than enough love, more than enough to give, more than enough for everyone, and where our lives are enriched by living generously into the assurance of God's abundance. And to illustrate God's abundance, I found this illustration, this graphic of a teacup spilling over running over. This is uh, motivated by my granny's favorite poem. I shared a little bit of it with you last week. It's called Drinking from the Saucer. The author is John Paul Moore, and the refrain of that poem is, I'm drinking from the saucer because my cup has overflowed. And that's how she lived her life. And so I would challenge us to consider that we have more than enough. Today's sermon's entitled, Enough to Give. I planned my sermon series ideally about six months out. And so six months ago, everything seemed to line up so perfectly for stewardship season, Pledge Sunday. The lectionary happened to provide a great story from the Gospels on generous giving. It seemed straightforward. It seemed tidy, even. And then the week got a little messy. It got a little complicated. There was a point in this week where my cup was not overflowing. In fact, it seemed a little empty. I wrote three different sermons in my head on Wednesday. My heart and my mind were all over the place. If you talk to me Wednesday, you can probably attest to that. But by Thursday, by Thursday, I was drawn back to this original plan, which might not have ever been my plan after all. And I saw that maybe this passage isn't so straightforward, but I felt an invitation. And so I extend that invitation to you all to dig a little bit deeper along with me. This is our scripture from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 12, verses 38 through 44. And it begins referring to Jesus as he taught. Jesus said, beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces and to have the best seats in the synagogues and places of honor at banquets. They devour widows' houses and for the sake of appearance say long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. He sat down opposite the treasury and watched the crowd putting money into the treasury. Many rich people put in large sums. A poor widow came and put in two small copper coins, which were worth a penny. Then he called his disciples and he said to them, Truly, I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the others who are contributing to the treasury. For all of them have contributed out of their abundance. But she, out of her poverty, has put in everything she had and all she had to live on. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God me just a moment. I'm going to kind of secure this a little bit better. There you go. All right. So Jesus might as well have said when he said, beware the scribes, beware the preachers. Jesus would say, they like to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces. I don't know. I don't know that you have to greet me with respect if you see me in H-E-B. Um, I would love a nod, probably a hug. Um, I don't know. I mean, I wouldn't hate a clergy discount every now and then. Um, (laughs) Not that I've ever gotten one. Uh, (laughs) In fact, uh, a few months ago, last year, in fact, I uh, decided to try Pilates, and I went to my local Pilates studio and did an introductory class and decided to buy a package of classes. And uh, the lady working the counter, she was signing me up, and she said, are you a hero? Uh, So I don't know that I understand your question. And she said, are you a first responder? You're like, fire, police, EMS. And I said, no. I said, I'm, I'm a Christian pastor. 
And she said, no, that doesn't count. (laughs) (laughs) Didn't count. I guess it depends on who you ask and what day you ask. But I got to tell you, pastors have been my heroes this week. My colleagues have been my heroes this week. And, And this week, I think we all felt a little bit like first responders, to tell you the truth. Um, Luckily, intentionally, and and also just by by fate, I have spent most of the week surrounded by clergy colleagues. Um, On Wednesday morning, we uh, quickly gathered those of us who could um, early Wednesday morning for for a Zoom call to, um, to pastor one another. Thursday, I had a a pre-scheduled lunch, which was very good timing. Uh, I've been attending a gathering of open and affirming pastors from all sorts of uh, faith traditions and and denominations at St. David's Episcopal. It happens once a month and happened to happen this week, and I wasn't going to miss it. And uh, I I told some people it was was so good for my spirit because I sat at the fun table. Um, We were the only table that had some laughs, and I hardly ever make that right choice, but I did on Thursday. And then Friday, I spent my day off in a day-long meeting at the seminary uh, with colleagues from Mission Presbytery. Uh, We gathered around a table for the Committee on Preparation for Ministry, and we got to interview uh, two wonderful candidates for the ministry process of ordination. And we got to have lunch together and break bread. And uh, pastors have been my heroes this week. They've, They've probably saved me. Um, both those that I know in person and those that I know only through their public platforms. They've boosted my spirit and renewed me in a sense of holy resilience and resolve. And that's why I stand before you this morning. I went from dreading this moment. I was joking with the choir earlier. I'd offered uh, several different people that I met on Wednesday and, and, and beyond the chance to preach. <laughs> um, nobody took me up on it. Um, so, and I'm glad. I'm glad because I stand here before you this morning honored to be in this pulpit, honored that you have graced us with your presence here in worship. And I might indeed have one of those best seats that Jesus was speaking of. I'll claim that. I came across this story. Charles L. Campbell writes about the act of preaching as a critical practice of nonviolent resistance, one that not only links the biblical text to today's moral and ethical challenges, but shapes the life and practices of churches like ours, communities of faith like faith. Campbell tells the story of André Trocmi, and I have no idea if I pronounced that French name correctly, but he was the pastor of a Reformed congregation in a small village in southern France that effectively sheltered over 5,000 Jews during World War II. And as Campbell tells it, on the Sunday after France surrendered to Nazi Germany, Trocmi stepped into the church's pulpit to proclaim, the responsibility of Christians is to resist the violence that will be brought to bear on their consciences through the weapons of the Spirit. And so Trachme took this best seat that he had of authoritative interpretation to which he had been called, and he preached. He preached week after week of Jesus' nonviolent resistance against oppressive political powers and his care for the most vulnerable, keeping this vision alive during a politically treacherous time in our history. And so this Sunday, November 10th, 2024, I don't presume the state of your spirit, the state of your soul, how you cast your vote, but I know that millions of us are reeling a little bit in the wake of the message that America's electorate has sent. And so I have the unique opportunity to join my voice with the voices of brave pastors who've come before me, brave pastors who are all across this city and in this nation doing the same thing that I'm doing with the confidence that Christ prioritizes the needs of society's most vulnerable. We have evidence of that in today's gospel reading. And with the confidence that God supports systems of political and economic justice. And so from this best seat in the house here, I guess, questionable, I want to remind us that the church of Jesus Christ, change begins with us in how we treat each other, 
how we work together to solve complex problems. More specifically, how we treat the metaphorical widow and the stranger and the orphan and even those that aren't metaphorical. Those among us who are the most vulnerable. In the Gospels, we see Jesus teaching his small band of 12 disciples. And by doing so, he started this groundswell of love and care for all of God's people. And so may we use our our platforms to start a groundswell of love and care for all of God's people. On election day, um, I opened the doors of the sanctuary and, and spent a good part of my work day um, here. Um, a few of you, very few of you, joined me. Uh, <laughs> but I know you were, you were with me in spirit. And because I had some time on my hands, I decided to um, do some Facebook and Instagram lives. And I don't pretend to be good at it. I told somebody I'm exactly the age to know it's important to do it and a little too old to know how to do it well. Um, but I did it. I did it. Uh, I, I did Instagram Live. I did Facebook Live. And I, I shared both of those. Um, I, I, I recorded them on the Faith Presbyterian Church uh, platform, but I shared them to my personal accounts as well. And I intended for those not to be political but pastoral. And I think I hit the mark because uh, of those four videos, we had four different distinct themes. I started with hope. I always start with hope. I usually try to land with hope too. But on election day, I started with hope. And then we went to stress and anxiety and then fear and then uncertainty. Because at that point, we all had a bit of uncertainty. And um, I counted it up. I looked looked at the, the social media insights. And I'll tell you that those four meager two minute videos were viewed over 4,000 times on uh, Facebook and Instagram combined, which kind of blew me away. Um, from, a, from a church who probably has 30 people here right now. Uh, but uh, that, was, that was a groundswell of, of love and care that we were able to put out into the world. And I don't pretend to know all 4,000 of those people. I'm sure I don't know them, Um, but I do know the people who liked and commented and shared, and I will promise you, those were bipartisan likes and comments and shares. And it was my intention to be as pastoral as possible, because I think it's when we come together on what we have in common, when we're vulnerable and open, that's when we're most teachable. That's when we have the greatest opportunity to use our influence for good. And in our gospel reading today, that's just what Jesus does. He looks at the activity of these scribes and this poor widow, and in two remarkable, teachable moments, he helps his disciples see the difference between good and bad, between right and wrong. And this comes in the gospels after Jesus had already flipped over the tables and cleansed the temple, and it was before he was arrested and tried, and crucified. And so here in the middle, in this messy middle part of the Jesus story, he was there in these temple courtyards, teaching his disciples and probably anybody else who would listen. And there would have been a constant flurry of activity, people coming and going, praying, giving. And so somewhere in all that chaos, Jesus is walking with his disciples, and when he sees a scribe swaggering by... With his nose in the air, he says, beware the scribes. Beware the scribes. This would have knocked the disciples for a loop. Because they had known about the scribes all their life. They were the preachers and the teachers of the time, the religious elite. And they had seen them in the temple in Jerusalem and even in their own hometowns. And they had been taught all their lives to treat them with deference. They were the religious professionals today's seminary professors or esteemed clergy. And so if you had asked the disciples if scribes were good or bad, they would have said, good, of course, that's what they had learned from their tradition. But with one swift kick, Jesus knocks those ideas out from under them and says, beware the scribes, as same as if he would say, beware the dog. He said it because he could see them through the eyes of God. He could see that all their pompous religious activity was just pretense that there wasn't a sincere religious bone in their bodies. That wasn't all the scribes, of course. I mean, just remember last week, earlier in this same chapter, a scribe asked Jesus about the greatest commandment, and in Mark, 
When Jesus says it's about loving God and loving others, the scribe agrees. Jesus and the scribe have common ground, and Jesus even tell him, tells him that he's not far from the kingdom of God. But in this story, these are other scribes who are so far from the kingdom, they'll never get there. And those are the ones Jesus tells his disciples to be aware of. He tells them to be discerning. In other words, don't take things at face value, at surface level. And so in that teachable moment, he teaches his disciples that you can't look on the outside of a person and tell what's on the inside. And then Jesus sits down opposite the treasury. Now the treasury was kind of like a a strong box with a big brass funnel coming out of it, kind of like the bell of a tuba. And the rich people would reach down into their money bags and scoop out big handfuls of coin and throw them against the side of the funnel so that they clanged and they rattled and they clinked down to the bottom of the box. And it made a big noise. It made a big show. Everybody would turn and look. Everybody was looking at them, the rich people. But what Jesus watched was the poor widow. He watched the poor widow who crept up to the treasury and placed her two small coins on the edge of the funnel and let them slide down noiselessly into the box. And nobody noticed except Jesus. And in that teachable moment, he drew the attention of the disciples to this woman and says, did you see that? Did you see what she just did? This poor widow has just put in more money than all of these rich people combined because they gave out of their abundance. But she out of her poverty, has put in everything she had to live on, literally her whole life. So again, Jesus was seeing her through the eyes of God, and what he saw was that her gift, although it was small, was actually huge. She wasn't just giving what she could spare. She was giving absolutely what she could not spare. She wasn't just throwing two coins in the treasury. She was throwing her life into the hands of of a loving God. And so the righteous scribe is revealed as a religious phony and the poor widow, rich in faith. And here we see Jesus taking the standards of the world once again and turning them upside down. He remains singularly unimpressed by money and power, position, prestige. He always seems to have his eye on the people that the world pushes to the margins. When a poor widow puts in two cents to the box, he's like, look at that. And in one teachable moment after another, he tries to teach his disciples that while everyone else looks at the outward appearance, God looks at the heart. Jesus saw what was in her heart. And what was there was a love for God so deep and a faith in God so strong that she could give away the last of what she had in the sure and certain hope that he would take care of her and provide for her every need. That's the kind of thing, that's the kind of thing I would hope Jesus would see in us if he were here this morning. Whether he's looking at me in the pulpit or watching you as the offering plate comes along your pew and you pledge your treasure and your talent to this church, to this body of Christ. I hope that he would see loving and generous hearts that care a great deal, a great deal more about what God thinks than about what anybody else thinks. I think that would be true. Research suggests that our brains and and perhaps our lives are pretty much formed in our early adulthood, about the age of, of 25. Research suggests that by the age of 25, we're, for the most part, who we're going to be. I can't accept that. (laughs) I can't accept the idea that, that we get to an age where we're no longer capable of of transformation, of our hearts being transformed. In fact, I know better because if you told my 25-year-old self that my almost 50-year-old self would be standing here, I'd not only be a pastor, I'd be a Presbyterian pastor, and not only would I be a Presbyterian pastor, but I would serve one of the most historically, socially, and, and theologically progressive churches in all of Austin, Texas. I'd have had some big questions. <laughs> there just doesn't exist a direct line from then to now. 
And I love Anne Lamott for saying that she doesn't understand all the mysteries of grace, but she knows this, that grace doesn't leave us where it finds us. I agree. Grace doesn't leave us where it finds us. As followers of Christ, as Christians, we're not born, we're made. We're forged by the people and the experiences that God puts into our lives. And one of the beautiful things about our Reformed tradition is that we have this tenet that God's not finished yet. God's never finished with us. We continue to be made through every teachable moment of our lives, including this one, my friends, including this current moment in which we found ourselves. I can't presume the state of your heart this morning, but if, like millions, this week did not result in what you'd hoped for, what you'd prayed for and worked for and fought for and voted for, stop arguing with that reality because this is where we are. Perhaps you would say, but we wanted to move forward and we don't want to go back. And I would say, we are not going back. We still value what we value. We still love who and what we love. And so hear this invitation to move forward with me in faith, with holy resilience, and with love. If you reached out to me this week for pastoral care, I've encouraged you to take time, to take time to feel whatever you're feeling to take time of reflection, to take a time of lament, if that's what you needed. But this morning, I would challenge you that reflection alone is not enough. Reflection leads to action, and our action is grounded in hope. Brene Brown, who's not a pastor, but a hero of mine, shared just yesterday, the research shows that hope is a powerful antidote to despair. What's interesting, however, is that hope is not an emotion. Hope is cognitive behavioral process. It's about having a goal, a pathway to achieve that goal, and a sense of agency or a sense of, I can do this, end quote. Also quoted another hero of mine in the faith, Kate Bowler, in one of my videos from Tuesday, but I will bring it back to you here because I think it's an important takeaway. She says, hope is like an anchor dropped in the future. It's gently pulling us forward. If we only do the next right thing. Doing the smallest next right thing is hard, but hey, it's all we got. The Christian church is at a crossroads at this point in our history. In fact, I think we've been sitting here for a while. But I don't believe that the church's days are numbered. I believe that the days are numbered for religious regimes that exist for their own well-being. The kind that Jesus describes in the gospel passage. But this is not faith Presbyterian church. Now more than ever, the world needs us. The world needs community of faith just like ours, just like the one that you've built. Now more than ever, the world needs communities of faith that live into what our PCUSA Book of Order says is the church that's called to be a sign in and for the world of the new reality which God has made available to people in Jesus Christ goes on to say we do that by healing and reconciling and binding up the wounds by ministering to the needs of the poor the sick the lonely the powerless engaging in the struggle to free people from sin fear oppression hunger injustice giving itself and its substance to the service of those who suffer Sharing with Christ in the establishing of his just, peaceable, and loving rule in the world. Don't miss this part. The church is called to undertake this mission even at the risk of losing its life. Last week, our treasurer 
updated us on our financial state. And it's precarious. We find ourselves in a precarious financial position, but not for the first time. We've been here before. I implore you, do not give into scarcity mentality. We have more than enough. We have more than enough love. We have more than enough to give. And if our days are numbered, and let's face it, all of our days are numbered, May we be resolved that we will spend each and every one of them doubling down on goodness and mercy. That's the next right thing. And so may our commitments this Pledge Sunday be an anchor of our hope that we cast out into the future that ever so gently pulls us forward. And may our future fully reflect the love of Christ that changes the world around us, even at the risk of losing our own life. Jesus calls his disciples in this passage, and he calls to us, Christ's church. Jesus calls us to himself and points out this poor widow and her manner of giving to reinforce the call of Christ to the church to give the whole of its life. Here in Mark's gospel, this is the last scene in Jesus' public ministry. This widow offers just a final glimpse into what Jesus is all about. He's on the way to giving the whole of his life for all of humanity, for the whole world. And that brings us to Christ's table. Thanks be to God that this is Holy Communion Sunday. Because today, God calls us to the table to find a new way, a new grace, a new hope, a new faith, a new life. God calls and we come. We come to the table to receive blessing and freedom and mercy and love. And God calls and we praise. And we're going long because we can and because we need to. But I call you to join me in an act of praise today as I share The beautiful words of Jan Richardson, which reminds us all of how wide God's table actually is, how wide it always has been, and how wide it always will be. She writes, the table will be wide, and the welcome will be wide, and the arms will be open to gather us in, and our hearts will open wide to receive. And we will come as children who trust there is enough, and we will come unhindered and free And in our aching will be met with bread, and our sorrow will be met with wine. And we will open our hands to the feast without shame, and we will turn toward each other without fear, and we will give up our appetite for despair. And we will taste and know of delight. And we will become bread for a hungering world, and we will become drink for those who thirst. And the blessed will see and will become blessing, and everywhere will be the feast.